Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. This is part 5 of Metabolic Diversity. This is lecture 60 of module 12. So in this lecture we are going to complete the last part of metabolic diversity in terms of the metabolic pathways that bacteria can utilize for, um, for again utilizing different types of substrates under different environmental conditions. So the last pathway that we are going to focus on is fermentation. After that, I will come to some practical applications of microbiology. So, how are microbes used in the lab or even in the field to uh, achieve certain uh, purposes? And we will start with analytical methods. So, the two uh, analytical methods that uh, we're, most of us are familiar with are Biochemical oxygen demand, BOD test, this is used for determining the biodegradation potential of organics in any wastewater. And then we will look at the biodegradation potential of organic material that is present in municipal solid waste. And that is a topic that uh, my research group has been working on, so we are uh, doing quite a lot of work in that area. So. I can spend some time talking about that. Now, um, in a previous uh, lecture, I have mentioned that anaerobic digestion or fermentation, which is very common in wastewater treatment, remember that the sludge from activated sludge processes is taken to an anaerobic digester. And there are many different types of anaerobic digesters. But the first thing um, that you see over here in this slide is that the complex polymers that are part of the biomass of this sludge which is contained in this sludge has to be broken down into monomers before the cells can even begin to absorb these nutrients and utilize them for energy and uh, growth. So we have these complex polymers like cellulose, polysaccharides, proteins and so on. So then these bacteria are extruding or excreting cellulitic as well as hydrolytic enzymes and these are also called bacteria for the same reason and they are uh, breaking down these polymers into their monomeric units by hydrolysis reactions. So, these mo uh, monomeric units are going to be sugars, amino acids, nucleotides and so on, the fatty acids, all of that. They will then be fermented by various groups of fermentative bacteria. So, we have fermentative bacteria that will utilize these monomeric forms and convert them to three key intermediates. So, we have hydrogen plus CO2, we have acetate and we have C acetate is C2, propionate is C3, butyrate is C4 and higher numbers of uh, organic acids. So these are what we also call um, volatile fatty acids and uh, these are cetogenic bacteria. So these, uh, there are a cetogenic bacteria that will convert H2 and CO2 to acetate. This acetate will be taken up by methanogenic bacteria and converted to methane. Organic acids will be taken up by hydrogen producing fatty acid oxidizing bacteria. They will again form these two intermediates of hydrogen, carbon dioxide and acetate which will again be taken up by methanogenic bacteria and converted to methane. So we have two major processes, we have methanogenesis and acetogenesis. So the formation of these or rather the formation of methane uh, gas depends on uh, conversion of the hydrogen and carbon dioxide to acetate, acetate directly to methane and the conversion of fatty acids to these intermediates as well. So 
you can see that the starting point, the key to this process is hydrogen gas. And this hydrogen gas is going to be key to the success of the anaerobic digestion process because as it is being produced, it has to be utilized and I will come back to this um, in the processes of methanogenesis and um, acetogenesis as well. So, um, the electron donors are hydrogen, nitrate, thiosulfate and electron acceptors are considered to be carbon dioxide. So the electron donor, like I said, is hydrogen, electron acceptor is CO2, the generation of ion gradients of protons or sodium that drive ATP generation is the principle behind this process. Energy is conserved in um, the substrate level phosphorylation reaction. So these homoacetogenic bacteria will utilize hydrogen along with protons and bicarbonates converted to acetate and water. Fermentation is the conversion of larger organic compounds like glucose to acetate and from bicarbonates to acetate. You can have fermentative bacteria and you can have autotrophic bacteria. So if you have autotrophic bacteria, then you get disproportionment and you have pyruvate being converted to acetate and CO. What happens in methanogenesis? Methanogenesis is the production of methane by anaerobic archaea bacteria which are also methanogens. So you can see some methanogenic uh, bacteria in this particular photo. Um, the cells are about 1.7 microns and they are, um, they are um, fluorescing under blue light and yes, um, so they are visible only with fluorescence. Um, yeah. So we have different pathways for meth methane generation. If you have a C1 compound, CO2 is converted to methane. This depends on the availability of hydrogen as an electron donor. You can have other electron donors like formate, carbon mon monoxide, organic compounds like alcohols and others. Let me see. And then you can have other C1 compounds like methanol and higher carbon containing compounds. So methanol, acetate and so many other compounds. If hydrogen is not present, energy can be obtained using sodium. And instead of proton motive force, you have sodium motive force. And this can drive methyl group oxidation. So PMF can drive ATP synthesis. In the absence of oxygen and other inorganic electron acceptors, that's what we call fermentation. It's an internally balanced process where carbon from the compound is partially oxidized and partially reduced. You can also have substrate level phosphorylation which I'm uh, abbreviating as SLP. It's a more direct method of synthesizing ATP rather than using proton motive force. Remember we have gone through the three biochemical pathways. If you have oxidative phosphorylation, then you can utilize PMF for proton motive force to generate ATP. If you don't have that, then you have a fermentation set of reactions where oxidative phosphorylation does not happen, proton motive force is not generated and you have um, just for substrate level phosphorylation. So you have high energy intermediates that are used in SLP. You have two ATPs per glucose molecule that are generated during the glyco uh, glycolysis of glucose to ethanol or lactate. Other substrates can provide less energy and we have looked at the energy efficiency of these reactions under uh, a previous topic. One key to all of, uh, one key to our understanding of all these processes is that the electron balance has to be maintained. How is the electron balance maintained? So whatever uh, is being donated by one substrate has to be picked up by the electron acceptor. And that's why when I said, you know, the simplest way of looking at fermentation is think about glucose, split it into equally into the most reduced form, which is methane and the most oxidized form, which is CO2. That is a way of maintaining electron balance. But here we have a key intermediate and that is H2 production. So relatively small amounts of H2 
gas are produced along with the fermentation products and whatever is produced has to be taken up very quickly. We then come to the production of molecular hydrogen and acetate from pyruvate. Again, if I remind you, uh, in the three biochemical pathways, one thing that is common is glycolysis and the end point in glycolysis is pyruvic acid or pyruvate. And this pyruvate will pick up electrons and result in the production of hydrogen or in the production of acetate and ATP. These are examples of common fermentation reactions which have some commercial um, applications as well. So, formation of alcohols is based on sugars. The sugar can be derived from any source. It can be rice, it can be wheat, it can be any other grain, it can be nuts. There are the number of alcohols that come from different sugars is endless. So, we have hexose being converted to 2 ethanol and 2 carbon dioxide by either yeast or zymomonas. Then you have homolactic fermentation. So, the best example like I said is milk being converted to um, yogurt which is lactic acid and then further conversion to um, other products. So, you have the sugar lactose being converted to lactate or ethanol lactate and ethanol and carbon dioxide and protons. Then you have propionic acid, lactate to propionate, acetate and carbon dioxide. Butyric acid, hexose goes to butyrate, acetate, hydrogen and so on. And you can see the number of organisms or bacterial species that are capable of fermenting these substrates. Um, we then go to the syntrophy. What is syntrophy? Syntrophy is the degradation of a substance and energy conservation by different, by two different or organisms or two different species which by themselves are not capable of doing it. And um, in the fermentation process, this is also called interspecies hydrogen transfer. So, I have already mentioned to you that you have acetogens which are generating hydrogen and acetate and you have methanogens. So, these two groups of bacteria have to uh, transfer hydrogen from one point to another and this is the syntrophy between them. So, what are the hydrogen consuming organisms? We have denitrifiers, we have sulfate reducing bacteria, we have homoacetogens and we have methanogens. All of them are consuming hydrogen. Examples are ethanol fermentation to acetate and then methane butyrate fermentation to acetate and hydrogen and then methane. In the first case, in the case of butyrate fermentation, let me see. Yeah. So, if we take uh, ethanol fermentation to acetate. So, here we have ethanol being converted to hydrogen and acetate. The delta G for this particular reaction is positive. So, by itself, it's not going to give any energy to the bacteria. So, the bacteria will not be able to utilize it. However, when, uh, when it is coupled, so when you have an ethanol oxidizing bacterial species in syntrophic relation with a methanogen, what will happen? The methanogenic reaction H2 plus CO2 going to methane is favorable. So, when these two reactions are combined by these two bacterial species which have a syntrophic relation, then the de net delta G for this reaction is negative and therefore possible, which is not the case otherwise. Um, in both cases, the first reaction is endergonic and H2 is produced. H2 that is produced has to be consumed in the second reaction, otherwise you have a problem because the first reaction will not proceed. So, if I were to say it in another way, this hydrogen has to be consumed as fast as it is formed for this to be complete. So, here is an example of one of these bacteria. So, we have Centrophomonas wolfei and it has been tested uh, in a syntrophic culture as well as in a pure culture. It's, um, this particular species is capable of converting crotonate to acetate 
or to butyrate using proton motive force okay but if it is in a syntrophic culture it will con convert butyrate to um, acetate and in the process produce hydrogen and this hydrogen will be taken up by methanogens and therefore you have a complete conversion to acetate in the other case you don't get complete conversion you still have butyrate so from this point onwards we are going to look at some of the applications of microbiology which have special importance in both civil and environmental engineering and science and so forth uh, because of lack of time, I'm going to focus only on two analytical methods. Four of them are mentioned over here, but uh, we will be looking at uh, we will be looking uh, at two of the major analytical methods that are noted over here. The first two. So um, by now you know that in the environment, aerobic heterotrophic bacteria are the most common group of bacteria and from an environmental perspective we want to be in a position to measure the extent and rate of biodegradation of different types of samples now the organic matter for heterotrophic bacteria can be present in water it can be present in soil or it can be present in solid waste material so the four methods that i have mentioned over here the first one is biochemical oxygen demand or some people call it biological oxygen demand bod this is a uh, associated with organic ma uh, material that is present in any type of wastewater so if you're dealing with municipal wastewater or with industrial wastewater and you want to know how much of the organic material in that wastewater is biodegradable then that is measured using the bod test so we're going to go through some details about the bod test then we come to uh, the degradation potential or you can also call it the biodegrade, uh, biodegradable fraction of the organic fractions of municipal solid waste. Now this seems like a mouthful. Let me explain. So municipal solid waste is a mixture of different types of materials. It's got recyclable materials like paper, plastic, glass, metals and so on. And it also has food waste, garden waste, street sweepings. Uh, so you have soil, you have dirt, all kinds of materials are present in municipal solid waste. We are interested in knowing how much of that mixed solid waste has organic material. So we know that food waste is organic in nature. We know that grass and uh, twigs and branches and leaves, all this uh, leaf litter or you might say vegetation, all of that is organic. You also have paper and plastic which are also organic in nature but we know that they're very different in their biodegradability compared to let's say food waste. So we have a large number of organic fractions in municipal solid waste and from a management perspective if I want to design treatment processes I need to know what the biodegradation potential of each fraction of municipal solid waste is and we can do this under aerobic conditions as well as under anaerobic conditions. So when we measure the biodegradation potential of organic fractions of municipal solid waste uh, we can do them under like I said aerobic or anaerobic conditions and I will go through some of the work that my research group has been involved with and they have been measuring aerobic biodegradation potential of different organic fractions. Uh, the same thing can also be done for natural organic matter. This natural organic matter is a problematic uh, group of contaminants that is present in water supplies. So whether you are drinking water or any other, um, basically municipal water supplies are the ones that are most affected by the presence of natural organic matter. It creates many problems in the treatment as well as distribution especially of drinking water so uh, we've in the past uh, we've measured the biodegradation potential of natural organic matter under aerobic conditions and uh, that has like i said several uh, applications in terms of water supply systems uh, there is another set of uh, research that has been gaining a lot of attention and that is measuring the biomethanation potential of different organic fractions 
after treatment with or without treatment and various types of treatment uh, methods have been used and this is under fermentative condition so you can see that we are looking at how different organic fractions will behave in the presence of different types of microbes under different um, conditions of oxygen availability so these are some major uh, areas of research and obviously uh, I'm going I'm not going to cover all four of them I will just cover the first two so let's start with the biochemical oxygen demand test or BOD test now this is a standard test that is used to determine the biodegradation potential of any wastewater so this has been in existence for probably a hundred years or so and uh, the standard test conditions are for five days the temperature is standardized to 20 degrees centigrade I think it started in the UK and uh, it has been more or less unchanged since then uh, we have made changes in India and I'll talk about that after at the end of this so this standardized test has uh, several parts to it now you know that wastewater whether it's municipal wastewater or sewage or any industrial wastewater will have varying degrees of biodegradable material um, if you think about municipal wastewater we often take a ratio of two it may be three or even four and industrial wastewaters can be completely non biodegradable or completely degradable so for example wastewater coming out of let's say a food processing uh, plant will have completely biodegradable material something coming out of a paper and pulp industry may be a mix of biodegradable and non biodegradable material uh, something coming out of a um, pesticide manufacturing plant may have no biodegradable material it may have only toxic chemicals and so on so depending on the nature of the wastewater you will have varying degrees of biodegradation potential of the material that is in the wastewater now you have to start with some kind of guesstimate of how much of the material is going to be biodegradable so i'll from this point onwards i'll take the example of municipal wastewater because that is what we deal with for for the most part and what we know uh, let me uh, also add a few more things here bod test bottles come in a standard size of 300 ml so if your municipal wastewater we know broadly speaking it may have about 300 to 500 milligrams per liter of uh, COD and maybe half of it is biodegradable so it has to be diluted you cannot add the entire thing because you may be knowing that the DO concentration in water cannot exceed 14 to 15 milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen has very low concentration in water it is oxygen is considered a sparingly soluble gas and the maximum concentration is let's say at zero degree centigrade no salinity you will get around 14 to 15 uh, milligrams per liter of oxygen and under our test conditions of uh, 20 degrees centigrade your maximum do level is going to be around 10 to 11 milligrams per liter okay now when we are monitoring the do levels this entire test is based on monitoring the do levels during the test period of five days so we have to do two things we have the first thing we need to do is to dilute our wastewater because if we take undiluted wastewater we will get a do level of zero at the end of the test period because it has extremely high um, organic it has highly biodegradable organic matter okay so the first thing we do is dilute it so in a 300 ml bottle you will probably add about 10 to 30 ml of wastewater to stay within this range of do drop and i will come to more details about the do drop in a little bit what is the remaining content of this 300 ml bottle after adding your original sample in a very small amount maybe 10 to 30 ml maybe 50 ml 
you will fill the rest of the bottle with dilution water. This dilution water contains all essential inorganic materials. We have already gone to the, through the law of the minimum and in this case we design our analytical methods to ensure that these uh, tests are carbon limiting only. The, all the other inorganic nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, uh, iron, calcium, magnesium, manganese, you name it, any of the nutrients have to be in surplus amount and it should be limited by carbon only to ensure that none of these micronutrients will limit bacterial growth. So, you are in a sense optimizing the growth of the bacteria and ensuring that only one nutrient, in this case the carbon um, containing substrate, is going to be the limiting nutrient. So that is the first thing. The second thing is if you are dealing with industrial wastewater, let us say like I said um, a pesticide. So let us say we have wastewater from a pesticide manufacturing plant. Now this toxic material is not going to contain any microbes to begin with. So you may have to add microbial seed to ensure that there is at least a good initial bacterial population. On the other hand, in municipal sewage, we do not need to add microbial seed because sewage has millions to billions of cells per ml. So no need for adding other seed. There is a sufficient uh, native population sufficient amount of native bacteria that will uh, be capable of degrading the organics in the wastewater. So like I said, this is the first part of the test. So uh, one more thing to note is that the BOD bottle is uh, basically it is manufactured in a particular way and the main difference between other bottles and a BOD bottle is at the top end of the bottle. So it is a cylindrical glass borosilicate bottle and the top part of the bottle has an inverted uh, frustum of a cone. So it's got an inverted uh, top and the stopper is also made of glass but it's frosted glass and when you fill the bottle, the bottle is filled to the brim, this glass stopper is literally dropped into the bottle to create what is called a water seal. Now this water seal will prevent any re-aeration during the incubation period. In fact, there is one more point that I need to mention that once the dilution water is added, um, it is also aerated. So, the aeration is done prior to filling the bottle to ensure that this dilution water is completely saturated with dissolved oxygen. So when it is added and the water seal is created, no further re-aeration is allowed during the incubation period of 5 days. Now these uh, bottles are then incubated in the dark. So we normally put them in an incubator shaker. They are kept at uh, the um, these bottles are kept in shaking um, systems within the incubator and there is no light inside the incubator and this is also a very essential part of the test. Light has to be kept out and this is to prevent algal growth in the bottles because if you are taking let us say a natural river water sample, it will contain algal cells. Now these algal cells will grow if light is present and if they grow they will contribute to the oxygen levels in water. So we do not want to allow that to happen because that will create interference in the results of the test. So that is why incubation is always done in the dark to keep the algal growth out of the system. Then we come to the end of the 5 day uh, test. At the beginning of the test we take the DO concentration in the mixed bottle. So you sacrifice the first bottle, de uh, determine the DO in the mixed uh, contents of the bottle. At the end of 5 days, you measure the DO concentration again. So you have a measure of the initial DO and the final DO. Now DO these days can be measured in many different ways. There are titrimetric metric methods, there are um, electrode uh, sensor based methods and we also have um, uh, spectrophotometric methods. So there are several methods that can be used for measuring DO 
concentration. Now, this delta drop from the initial DO to the DO after five days has to be measured and if you uh, suspect that your dilution water has some amount of organics in it significant enough to contribute to the DO drop then you need to run what is called a sample blank and the delta DO or the DO drop in the sample blank has to be subtracted from the DO drop in the sample. So these are the test conditions. Then we come to the next point and that is how to determine whether the results of this test are useful or not. So there are two thumb rules that are used over here. One is that the delta drop within the five day period should exceed or be equal to two milligrams per liter. So the minimum DO drop or change in DO concentration should be greater than two milligrams per liter. The minimum delta DO should be greater than two milligrams per liter the maximum uh, DO by definition will be DO saturation. So these are the two conditions that will determine whether the results of the test can be useful or not. Now in India uh, we have two issues. The temperature in the ambient environment is much higher than what you um, have in comparison to a country like the U uh, UK. So the temperature that the CPCB has chosen is 27 degrees centigrade and because reaction kinetics are much higher at a higher temperature so the three day we are using three days rather than five days to get a result and um, these five day results correspond to about 60 to 70 percent of the entire biodegradation uh, biodegradable fraction of the wastewater content so the three day with at 27 degrees centigrade is expected to give similar results so here we have the results of a hypothetical bod test now in a bod test we normally take only initial do concentration and final do concentration and you can uh, once you know what your do saturation is you determine the concentration in the sample and you will get your do consu consumed by subtracting it okay so do 0 minus do at time t like i said that that's a simple two point test but supposing you were a little more ambitious and you were to set up your test for one month and take samples at more frequent intervals. So supposing you were to take a, a sample at time t is equal to zero for seven days you were to take samples almost every day and then with lesser frequency over a 30 day period. If you were to do that you would get a curve that has this shape okay now what we are doing in a BOD test is just five days that's a standard BOD test you can see there is a slight inflection in the curve at about seven days I'm not teaching you all of these but you can always refer to any textbook uh, about water pollution but there are two parts to the BOD test which is not captured in the five day BOD test. Now in the five day BOD test what happens is that you have um, you have a very high concentration of organic matter but you also have a significant concentration of nitrogen. I've already mentioned that nitrifying bacteria are slow growers and they are autotrophs. Heterotrophic bacteria, aerobic heterotrophic bacteria are fast growing bacteria and in the presence of oxygen they will multiply very fast as long as the carbon containing substrate is present. So in this first week of the BOD test, aerobic heterotrophic bacteria are going to dominate. Their food supply is higher, oxygen levels are high and in comparison to the nitrifying bacteria they are going to grow faster. So when they grow faster their population will dominate and that is what we are calling phase one of the BOD test. Okay, So this is what we call the carbonaceous biological 
oxygen demand or biochemical oxygen demand CBOD and this is entirely being consumed by aerobic heterotrophic bacteria. Then we come to the second part of this curve where, the, where there is an inflection. This second phase is when your carbon containing substrate is beginning to dwindle. Oxygen levels are still reasonably high uh, enough to keep this, this group of bacteria happy aerobic autotrophic nitrifying bacteria will still continue to grow under these conditions because now they are no longer out competed by the heterotrophic bacteria. So these slow growers will start making their impact felt in the second phase which is not captured in the standard BOD test. So this inflection reflects what we call nitrogenous biological or biochemical oxygen demand NBOD. So if you remember what I said ammonia going to um, ammonia plus oxygen is being converted to nitrite and nitrate. So this second phase is exactly that reaction where ammonia is being converted to nitrite and nitrate and oxygen is consumed in that process. So this is the uh, BOD test if it were to be carried out over a long period of time and this orange line which is an extension of uh, the first part of this curve is telling you what the ultimate carbonaceous BOD is. So this is the ultimate carbonaceous BOD and the remaining part is the nitrogenous BOD. Let us now come to the second part. So now we can take a look at another test. So using the same principle as the BOD test, we have now um, come up with an aerobic biodegradation test to determine or rather let me put it another way, uh, using the same principles that are part of the BOD test, we've taken the same ideas and transferred them to uh, measuring the biodegradable fractions or the biodegradable potential for different organic fractions of municipal solid waste under aerobic conditions. So here again aerobic heterotrophic bacteria are being utilized even though our results tell us a slightly different story but I'll come to that later. So the question that we're trying to answer in these tests is how can we measure the extent and rate of biodegradation of the organic fractions of uh, municipal solid waste. Now what I did not mention in the previous um, talk about BOD test with the kind of data that I showed you over there you can come up with the reaction rate constants which are very important when you're designing treatment processes because the design is based on our understanding of the reaction kinetics. So the same thing is done over here. So you can do it in column studies or you can do it in batch studies. It's much simpler to do it in the batch studies because you have more control over all the parameters and it's much easier to measure the various parameters that you need to. So like I said it's a modification of the BOD test and we are doing two things. We are measuring the biodegradable fraction and we are measuring the rate at which biodegradation is happening. The test simulates natural conditions just like the BOD test with one major difference and that is we are ensuring that the system is carbon limited only, that the microbes are growing under carbon limiting conditions and all other inorganic nutrients are there in excess of the microbial requirement. So then we come to the organic fractions of the municipal solid waste that we've already tested. So we've done newspaper, magazine paper, different types of paper. And remember that newspaper has very high lignin content. It is uh, more or less pulp that has, it's basically the process of creating newspaper is called mechanical pulping. There is very little chemical addition, bare minimum of chemical addition in comparison to magazine paper and A4 paper which have high degree of chemical processing along with mechanical 
pulping. So the weight gram per gram for newspaper versus magazine and A4 paper, you will find that there are very different um, quantities of organic matter in each of these paper fractions. So those were measured and so was leaf litter. We've also done studies with floral waste, fruit peel waste, and we've also repeated studies with newspaper leaf litter and chana dal. Chana dal is a leguminous uh, grain, uh, a legume or a pulse that comes from uh, plants. So these are some of the results that we've uh, seen. And I won't go into any of the details because of lack of time, but you can refer to the papers which are referenced at the end of this slide, uh, at the end of this PPT. So I'll just point out some of the major um, results. We were measuring TSS and VSS. TSS means total suspended solids, VSS means volatile suspended solids. Volatile suspended solids can be associated with the microbial biomass or with the organic content of the um, material itself. So the loss of VSS is the main um, result in our case because that is the biodegradable fraction that is lost, that is mineralized. Okay. So if you remember our key equation of CO uh, of glucose plus oxygen going to CO2 and water. So here we have organic matter plus oxygen going to CO2 and water. So any loss in VSS is basically attributed to mineralization of the carbon. So we got 43.6% loss of organic matter in floral waste as compared to 76% in leaf litter. So just comparing these results tells us that floral waste very uh, difficult to uh, understand even is known to be more resistant to biodegradation compared to leaf litter and the tannin lignin content was more biodegradable now this is kind of contrary to what you might expect for the simple reason that um, that the tannin lignin in floral waste is likely to be low molecular weight compared to leaf litter which has high molecular weight uh, tannin and lignin and now this high molecular weight material is likely to be resistant compared to the floral waste. Now there are other studies in the literature which have also pointed out that floral waste is less biodegradable compared to leaf litter and other materials like that. So uh, here we have a few more results and in this case two different uh, sets of conditions were examined with floral waste. So in the first case we had floral waste with passive aeration. Passive aeration was provided by using vented uh, caps on the test tube so air could pass in and out without any bacterial contamination because the tortuous path of air would prevent the bacteria from entering but allowing air to enter and uh, the inoculum in this case was soil. In the second case the BOD bottles were used along with floral waste so no aeration during the incubation period was provided and cow dung was used as the source of bacterial seed and you can see the difference. Uh, this condition without aeration and with cow dung as the inoculum gave better results not a huge difference but significantly better results compared to floral waste with aeration and soil inoculum uh, in terms of TSS as well as uh, VSS. VSS the results are insignificantly different they are almost equal and in terms of tannin lignin removal also it is not a significant difference. So uh, whether you provide aeration in terms of vented caps or whether you use cow dung or soil inoculum at least in this set of uh, experiments there was no significant difference. Um, in another set of experiments with fruit peel waste there was a significant difference with different inocula. So soil bacteria gave us 70 percent removal in terms of ESS. Uh, cow dung supernatant gave us 83 percent removal of VSS and wastewater sludge which is teeming with bacteria and which we thought might give good results gave us only 60 percent removal of VSS. 
and it made a small difference to the C by N ratio as well. But what is most important in terms of the measurement was the uh, biodegradable fraction which is measured in terms of change in VSS. So to summarize uh, some of our major findings, we have a method for determining the biodegradable fraction of any organic material in the lab. Uh, this biodegradable organic material can be mineralized under aerobic conditions by a consortium of bacteria. Now these bacteria like I said can be from soil, they can be from cow dung, they can be from wastewater sludge or any other type of um, group of uh, organisms from any other part of the environment. These consortia of bacteria will have aerobic facultative as well as anaerobic bacteria. We have done some stoichiometric um, calculations of um, the level to which oxygen is likely to be used if it was a strictly aerobic uh, pathway that was being utilized by all the bacteria. So we have uh, clear indications from our results that it was not just the aerobic bacteria that were responsible for the biodegradation of this material, but a combination of all of these bacteria which are often present in any of these consortia. Uh, then we have uh, in terms of DO levels in all of our tests, we had adequate DO in the water, in the uh, media. So it was always greater than 5 milligrams per liter and the pH was maintained using a buffer that provided neutral pH as well as phosphate or phosphorus for growth. So in all cases there was a minimal change in pH and it was always just around 7. We found that floral waste had less biodegradable material compared to leaf litter and the biodegradation of fruit peel waste was affected by inoculum uh, type but not floral waste. So these are some of the major findings and this is just a very uh, small snapshot of everything that uh, has been done but uh, for obvious reasons of uh, time, limit, uh, time limitations I am not going too far. And these are some of the references any of you who are in uh, anyone who is interested in this material can refer to the papers that are listed over here along with the textbooks. Thank you.